uh, I'm not preaching today. We're not going to have a message today. I know some of you are like, yeah, right, good. Um, but even better news than that is we're going to have some people share their story today. And so our first story is going to be shared by Brandy Birch. And so I'm going to have Brandy come up here. And uh, would you guys just give her a round of applause? This takes a lot of courage. Um, it takes a lot of courage to share your story. And so, <laughs> I don't know if you're talking to me or her, but, oh, okay. <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just really excited for, for this and for everybody who's going to be sharing their story. So we're, it's going to be a little bit different today. Um, there's going to be some pieces of story sharing, uh, um, some pieces of just reflection in general. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited. So without further ado, I'll let Brandy get us started. So work out this microphone. There we go. Okay. Oh, well, thanks. I really appreciate um, being able to share a little bit of our story. Um, I was going to start off with just kind of introducing our kids. We have three. Um, which I think you saw in the video too. So we have Blaine, who's five, um, Eleanor or Ellie is three and a half, and then Madison or Maddie is one. So I've got to be honest, when Chris asked me, he wanted me to share about what does motherhood mean to me, the first word I thought was torture. Um, that might be reflective of our current stage in life. So having such little kids, um, has been demanding, but also like our, um, our youngest daughter, we found out at 20 weeks um, that she'd be born with a cleft lip and palate. So that's her when she's about a month old. And for those that you don't know, it's, it's yes, it's, um, doctors have come a long way and there's so much that they can do and it's a very long journey. So in her first year of life, she's had two surgeries so far. And so um, this is actually, um, after her second surgery, so a lot of work that they did there. She will have some more as she grows and, and different needs like that, but um, that's kind of where we are in the season of life. So going back to what motherhood means to me, um, I think it's um, the person, um, and I'll even speak about God this way too, but that they are there to attach to, they're there to be the person is that you want to go to when it's like the most wonderful thing in the world that has happened um, or when the most terrible thing has happened, right? There's that, that sense of connection and that drawing too. And um, I could talk about my kids, but um, I'd rather actually share about how God has been mothering me and in the very specific, very cool ways that he has shown up to say like, hey, I see you, especially in this very, very difficult time. I see you and um, I'm letting you know that I'm with you. So to kind of give a, a little bit of backstory to that, just a little detour, <laughs> like one of my favorite self-care things is to like read, have some coffee, sit by the fire. And so I was, have been reading a lot lately um, and there's this one um, section that I was reading, and I get, Peter, you can go into more, the, more of this, correct me if I'm wrong, but he was talking about faith, but really the more accurate translation of that is trust, right? So that was just, that was just in my mind. Hold that thought for a second. So then a few weeks ago was like the all-time low. I mean, I am telling you, Maddie's surgery was a very rough recovery. It was full, four full weeks of like just really intense crying, getting up, no sleep, like, whew, am I going to do this? And then by about six weeks, it started getting better. And she's pretty much back to normal now, but, you know, she's still little. So <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of sacrificing and um, fatigue. And so in that moment, I'm like, I had this just horrible day, and I'm pleading with God, like, God, I need to hear from you. Like, please talk to me. Like, say something to me. I am tired. Like, I have three little human beings that are so needy, and I'm like, how do I get up every day and keep filling these needs? Like, I am tired, <laughs> and I feel like the word tired is like an injustice to the word because I cannot even explain, like, how empty I was. So... Nick and I started watching this show, and if you haven't heard of it or watched it, it's a very interesting show to watch during a pandemic. Um, it's called The Last Ship, and I won't go into details of it, but basically it's this ship that um, they, they were out to sea, and the, um, something happened to the ship, and they weren't able to generate water. And so at this point in time, at the scene, they're 
without water, they're going on two days. And so this particular scene includes the captain and the master chief. And the master chief wants to encourage the captain to keep going. And so he says to him, um, to the captain, you know, I, I know that you know that um, I was in a car accident and that my family died in that. And what you may not know is that I was the one that caused it. Um, and so he had a very rough recovery. He was in the ICU for like 82 days. And he would wake up and he would say, like, God, why did you spare me? Like, how am I going to keep going? How am I, um, why, um, what's the purpose? And so he said, he was telling the captain, you know, I woke up and then I took a step, right? I think like physically, like he got up and tried to take a step. And then the next day I took another step. And then the next day I took another step. And he said to the captain, that is what faith is. So in that moment was this like, I knew that I knew that I knew that God was telling me, remember, faith equals trust, saying to me, Brandy, this is how you get through each day. You trust me. Trust me that I will meet you every morning, that I will get you through the day, and that I will meet you there. Um, so I wanted to share that because um, it kind of highlights the, the challenges, the difficulty of having three kids and that it's not all roses and rainbows and sh sunshine. Yes, there are definitely moments of that. And I guess I think that wanting to share um, really where I'm at now, and then also like the, the absolute beauty um, of this time, that there's like this reliance for me on God, that God is mothering me. And sometimes I feel like um, that maybe there's like a joke around this as well, where something is going wrong and like there's a fire happening and everyone's looking around like, where's the adult, where's the adult? And I'm like, oh crap, I'm the adult. <laughs> that is me now. So I feel like sometimes I still wanna be a little kid and I still need to have someone to be like, hey, I, I've got this and I'm the adult. And I think that um, that's kind of where I'm at and I wanted to share that. So that's my story. <laughs> well, thanks, Brandy, for your vulnerability. I'm sure there are many of you in this room and online who can relate to that story, right? Who can relate to some of the trials and perils of parenthood, um, but also some of the joys of that as well. And, and so, and, and I think that, um, you, you know, you guys heard motherhood is no joke, but in some ways, we're all mothers. And in Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 through 50, it says, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, who is my mother and who is my brothers and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards the disciples, he said, here are my mothers. Here are my brothers, my sisters, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother and sister and brother. So in no way at all, and I don't want you to hear this, am I downplaying the role of motherhood? Because it, like I said earlier, it is no joke and I've seen that firsthand. But God gives us all the title of mother because we are all in some ways his bride. And in some ways, we are all giving birth to his presence within us, to his kingdom within us. Um, there's this uh, guy named Ronald Rollheiser. He wrote a book called The Domestic Monastery. And he says, being a mother or a father stretches the heart just as the womb is stretched in pregnancy. This is because among all loves, parental love is perhaps the one that most pulls your heart out of self-love. Parenting reshapes the core of your being to help you to love more like God loves. God's motherly heart of self-giving love has been placed in all of us to embody the self-giving love to everybody around us. He goes on to say, uh, he, he goes on to talk about this guy, Carlo C Caretto, one of the 20th century's best spiritual writers. He said he spent many days in the Sahara Desert um, praying. But he, when he got back, he, he once confessed that he felt his mother, who spent nearly 30 years raising children, 
was much more contemplative than he was and less selfish. And so I think even in the role of motherhood, there is this uh, sense of prayer and contemplation that stretches beyond any practice of <laughs> solitude or whatever you want to say to get to that. And so um, there's this there's just spirituality in it. And so as you think about this today, we're going to, I'm going to, they're going to, the worship team is going to lead us in a song here. And you have a little note right here. Um, hopefully you picked one up coming in and, and you got a pen with you as well. And while they're singing this song, I'm going to have you guys just write a note to your mother. And maybe you have a good relationship with your mother. Maybe you don't. Maybe your mother is still alive, and maybe she's not. But what I want you to do is I want you to just write a letter to your mother. And it doesn't have to be, I, I intentionally did not get thank you letters, because it doesn't have to be a thank you letter, although it could be. Um, but I want it to be just an honest reflection of your mother. And, and so spend some time in the next five minutes writing a letter to your mom this morning.
Okay, so I know you met me earlier, but Francis for Joni, and it's really good to be here and see a lot of you and friendly faces. So it feels like a spiritual homecoming for me. And um, Chris asked me to share uh, from a perspective of someone who doesn't have their own kids. And when I was a teenager, I would have said I didn't want kids, but I don't know of a teenager that necessarily says that. Um, and then when I got a little bit older, maybe late teens and early 20s, I used to say, I want to have them, but I didn't want to have them. <laughs> because the thought of giving birth was absolutely terrifying to me. And, um, and in my early 20s, I went to work at a camp called Canacuc in Canacomo down in Branson, Missouri and just fell in love with working with kids and um, met so many great Christian counselors and people there and just really had envisioned having a family and marrying someone and raising, you know, Christian kids and all kinds of activities and fun and, you know, just really having a chance to shape a kid's life. Like, uh, that really kind of came alive for me. And uh, so I had several serious boyfriends, one at 21, one at 29, one at 39. Um, and they fell apart. And when I got to be 35, and I know women who are single or have gotten to that age without having kids can really feel that clock ticking in the background that uh, maybe you didn't notice was even there until then. So at age 35 to 40, that clock just kept getting louder and louder and louder. And at 39, I dated a guy that thought, this is it. This is just like God to come through the third time's a charm and come in at the 11th hour. It's just like him to come through. And then that relationship fell apart. And I was devastated. And I went through a grieving that was not only the breakup of this relationship, but also grieving I knew I wouldn't have my own kids. And I had many, many nights of crying and um, pain. And, you know, I, I used to describe it like someone took a knife and just went <laughs> and bleeding, and yet nobody could see that I was feeling this. So I felt like I would walk around and with this gaping wound that nobody could see. And uh, it was a very painful five years, like 40, 40 to 45. And um, a lot of you know that I am a counselor and I have a private practice, just like Brandy. Um, and um, when you're a counselor, you have this privilege of being able to sit with people from all different standpoints. So in one month, I might meet with somebody who um, was raped and had an abortion, another person who may was raped and gave up their kid for adoption, um, another person who adopted and the challenges with adoption, another person who is adopted and wondering about their birth mom, and another person whose mom died, and another person whose son won't talk to them anymore as an adult, and another whose, whose child is addicted to something. And so I would be able to sit with all the different angles of motherhood with people as I walk alongside them. And it really, you know, broadens your perspective on everything. And um, somewhere in the middle of that, you know, you know, somewhere by the end of maybe about five years, I had come to a place of acceptance, and it was grieving like a death, like something that had really died. And um, I think in the middle of that, I, there were three things that really stick with me that I want to share. One is that in everything, there's mixture. Whether, you, whether you're married or whether you're single, whether you have kids or whether you don't, whether you have a job or whether you don't, whether you, you know, live in this neighborhood or that neighborhood or whatever, that there's mixture. And just coming to that place of accepting mixture in whatever your place might be. Um, the second thing is about um, uh, just this understanding that there's a lot of side, this, this side, there's a lot of things this side of heaven that are not fixed. There's a lot of things that are not healed. There's a lot of things that will never be the same. And it's okay. And I've, you know, kind of come to this place of being able with my own life and with other people to go, yes, 
in the in the big end of things god will redeem all but this side of heaven there's a lot of things that that we just journey together we suffer together and we walk together and it's okay for it to um, not have a, a bow tied up on it and then the last thing is about um how you know chris just said it but you know god in us as a mother like we all have this desire to mother and nurture and and shape a life and i have found that in many many ways some of you have been my kids some of you have been my my mother who mothered me and the chance to shape a life and so that creativity that is in there uh, because it's god's life in us will come out in many different shapes and forms and things like that so um a lot of you know that i got married older so um in my late 40s, I met Bill, and Bill was everything I didn't know I wanted because he was divorced and had kids, and um, we got married, and I have three stepdaughters, and I have two grandchildren through them as well that I absolutely adore them all. My stepdaughters, these grandkids, I just got done seeing, and I'm in love with these kids. Their names are Kyle and Penn, and I'm like, they will only know me as Granny Franny. And, um, and they're just adorable, and I just love them to pieces, and my stepdaughters as well. And I am so blessed to have them in my life. And um, I was thinking about just how, you know what? I kind of got what I wanted. I have them, but I didn't have them. <laughs> So I am, you know, I, so some people are in the middle of their story and there's always more to the story. And um, I just am very, very grateful. And the tears that I now have are often tears of joy. And yes, I still get pangs of things here and there that are that wave of loss and that still will happen till the day I had died. And that is okay. And um, I'm still very, very blessed. So thank you. Thanks, Francis. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your story and, and your vulnerability, Francis. This is hard to jump into like a theological reflection about not having kids and, and the pain around that. And I know for some of you in this room and online maybe watching, this has been your reality. Um, and I know the pain for you is very real. And without discounting your experience at all, I want to tread lightly here. And I want to say that you are not alone. Even when you feel so alone, I know Frances was talking about how you know, she felt like her body just was being ripped open and she could tell nobody about this. So even when you feel so alone, so empty, so confused. I want to say this is that we are all suffering together. We're all together in this. In no way am I trying to minimize the pain and the suffering of those uh, going through this situation. Rather, I want to say we see what you're going through. We see you. You're a part of us. You're part of our community. And I also want to say this, is that, you know, suffering is one of the most common human experiences. Like, we can all, we've all been there. Whether it's big or whether it's small, we've all been there in some ways. Um, but, but this, too, is it's also, suffering is also a common experience we have with the divine, which is really interesting. We have this common experience with Christ because we share in his suffering as well. In fact, in Philippians 3, chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 10, it says, that I may know him, this is Paul speaking, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and may share his suffering, becoming like him in death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. He's brought us, all of us, into his family. He's made us his own. He's made us a part of him. And that is through suffering, but it's also through what Francis was talking about, this resurrected life. 
So as we share in his suffering and in his death, we also share in his resurrected life. We're all hurting and suffering together, empty and impoverished and in deep need of Christ to fill us with his life. But the beauty of being part of the family is we get to sit in these spaces together. We get to suffer together. So we're going to do another short reflection here as the worship team leads us in this next song. And what I want you to do is I want you to just close your eyes. And I want you to imagine your spaces of suffering. Whether that is places you're suffering right now or places that you've suffered in the past. And this could be large or it could be small, but, but we've all been there. And so I want you to think about it. And, and I think so many of us have felt alone in these places. But I want you to imagine the suffering presence of Christ entering into that space with you, sitting with you in that. Not necessarily fixing anything, as Francis said, but just sitting there with you in that. And then I want you to imagine your community, your people, the people who have entered that space with you as well. Maybe it's people from this church, maybe it's some family members, but I want you to imagine them sitting there with you as well. Not fixing it, just being present with you. So as we sing this next song, as we listen to this next song, let's reflect on those spaces of pain and sorrow and suffering in our own lives. Your power, the oceans open wide. You're 
fire falls down, heaven and earth collide. Oh, King Jesus, forever by my side. Your power, your presence breaks strongholds, King of heaven. Good morning. Um, my name is Carmen Hernandez. I'm another mama at the sanctuary that is going to share my story with you. Um, so anyway, I have a love-hate relationship with Mother's Day. Um, <laughs> when I was little, I always knew I wanted to be a mom. Sorry, I'm adjusting here. Um, anyway, sorry. I never thought about the details. I just knew I wanted to be a mom, and God in his infinite wisdom made me a mother to five children. Um, they are the reason that I love Mother's Day, and I'll get more to that in a minute. The reason I hate Mother's Day is because today is my 20th Mother's Day without my own mother. Um, she passed away when she was 57 after a three-year battle with cancer, and I miss her, like Peter said, every day. Um, but especially on Mother's Day. Today I'm reminded of all the things in life that I don't get to share with her. From simple things like calling her up and asking her how to care for a rose, to more serious things like how did you stay sane with four teenagers? How did you love us through our stupidity and raise us in those years? Because that's where I am right now. Um, when you want to be seen for your true self and loved and cared for in all kinds of ways, you gravitate towards your mom, and I miss it. I miss her, and I will never not miss her. Now for my love part of Mother's Day, I love homemade cards and little crafts and small handprints. These are the things that fill my soul as a mom. The one up on the screen is from my almost 20-year-old daughter when she was around five. And what I love about that is that even in her gift, she's trying to justify herself. So <laughs> explaining to me who it's from, who it's not from, and um, so sorry for all of the frustration. <laughs> I think that's what we do with God sometimes. We um, try to justify ourselves in our gifts to him. Um, Anyway, when we do converse with him or create for him or try for him, I think he feels how I feel. And what I feel is just complete and total adoration for my kids when they do this stuff for me. So not all of my children actually came to me the traditional way, Francis. <laughs> my last one came to us through adoption. Um, my baby Vincent turned 13 last week. And this marks the end of a season, a two-decade season of raising school-aged children. I feel a little victorious and a little nostalgic all at the same time. Last week also happens to mark the seven-year mark since we brought Vincent, almost six-year-old Vincent, home and grafted him into our family for good and forever. The journey to become a mom started a long time ago at a church on the hill called Lookout Mountain Community Church. 
There was a sermon by an assistant pastor there named Aaron Hartunium, if I'm saying his last name right. For those of you that know, I'm guessing the year was around 2004, and I was still deeply missing my own mother. Uh, Vincent wasn't even born at this time, and I marvel at how the Lord started to prepare my heart for a child yet to be born. That day, Aaron wove into his sermon the plight of orphans in general, with more specific details about the state of the Colorado foster care system. There was something being circulated through churches called the Heart Gallery. The Heart Gallery is a group of professional, beautifully done pictures of orphans in Colorado. Older children with personal descriptions, children that are usually free and clear to be adopted. They are just waiting, waiting for their forever home. Kind of like we are waiting for our forever home. The Heart Gallery happened to be on display at Lookout Mountain that day. After church, I took a look, and these kids were like all kids. Beautiful, vulnerable, adorable, mischievous, needy. They just didn't have parents. My heart was pierced, and after losing my own mother as an adult, I just couldn't fathom the pain and loneliness of being a motherless child. But I had a newborn, and a two-year-old, and a teenager, and I was pursuing a master's degree. And life went on. Fast forward a few years, and the calling to adopt was present and more concrete than ever. My husband and I were in agreement and slowly started on our official journey to find the child God had for us. It was early 2010 by this time, and our youngest daughter was just four. We were open to a toddler, because don't you know everybody wants to adopt a newborn? We were connected with an amazing organization called Project 127, uh, which is in reference to James 127, if you're familiar with it. James 127 says that religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Beautiful and simple and yet so hard. After completing adoption training and mounds of paperwork, we were ready. And we waited. And we waited like the kids in foster care. The county has communicated that if they could possibly place kids with a relative, that was always the ideal choice, and we were a distant second in the lineup, as we should be. Then one morning, three years later, this is how long we had been waiting, in 2013, my husband was looking on the Heart Gallery, which was now online, and a picture of an adorable little five-year-old Hispanic boy came up. That picture stole my heart, and we thought to ourselves, hey, we're Hispanic, sort of. Um, it said in his description that he likes Legos, soccer, and superheroes. Well, what? That is amazing, because in our basement, we literally had a room called the Lego Room. It was full of Legos. We, um, my husband had coached and played soccer, our kids all played soccer, and then the superhero thing. We all actually loved them, and in fact, I'm married to the man I am today because I knew Green Lantern's secret identity. <laughs> Ladies, take note. <laughs> um, it kind of seemed like the perfect match. He wasn't exactly a toddler, but diapers are overrated anyway. So after inquiring and waiting and hoops and discussions and roadblocks, it all came to be. On a warm spring day in 2014, we brought our last baby home and celebrated his sixth birthday a few days later. Adoption is certainly a special way to enter into motherhood, and it brings with it unique challenges. When a child, whether a newborn or older, loses their birth family and comes to a place of needing adopted, there is a deep and persistent grief that takes place. It's grief for all that was lost and will never be. Grief for the family that was yours, the culture, the genetics, the traditions. Grief for the trauma that has been experienced and cannot be undone. Adopting is an intimate and beautiful and sorrowful place where love meets pain and together a journey takes place. I have a special bond and adoption that I don't have with my biological children because I haven't had to walk the path of grief with them. In Isaiah, it mentions that our Lord is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and it only makes me think that adoption is truly holy ground. I count myself as incredibly blessed that I get to watch the Lord redeem all of these things and truly bring beauty from ashes. This is our kids just last summer on the beach in Florida, 
and Vincent is grafted into our family. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story, Carmen, and um, thanks for your vulnerability. You know, we appreciate your experience, and, and we know that there's some of you in this room who have had similar experiences, and some of you online maybe who have had a similar experience. And, and in some smaller ways, I think maybe too, we can all relate with this story. We're all adopted in a sense, right? We're all grafted into the family of Christ. He's called us his own. He has called us his children. Galatians 4, 4 through 7, uh, and I'm going to read it from the message paraphrase, says this. But when the time arrived that was set by God the Father, God sent his son, born among us of a woman, born under the conditions of the law so that he might redeem those of us who have been kidnapped by the law. Thus we have been set free to experience our rightful heritage. You can tell for sure that you are now fully adopted as his own children because God sent the spirit of his son into our lives crying out, Papa, Father. Or you could probably also say there, Mama, Mother. Doesn't that privilege of intimate conversation with God make it plain that you are not a slave but a child. And if you are a child, you're also an heir with complete access to the inheritance. He has adopted us to be part of his family. And there is messiness and there is complexity and all that, just as Carmen shared. But we are a family, right? We're a family. We are his children, all of us. You know, from this same book that I referenced earlier, Ronald Rollheiser says, God is love. God is love might be translated to read, God is family. God is community. God is shared existence. And whoever shares his or her existence inside community and friendship is participating in the very flow of life and love that is inside the Trinity. That's a beautiful statement. And so when we come to the table, all of these shared experiences come with us. We're all mothers. We've all suffered. And we're all adopted. I used to, uh, my family used to go to um, this other family's house. We were family friends. And um, our family had six people in it, and their family had nine people in it. And we would all gather around this ginormous table. It was like a circular table, and they had one of those lazy Susans on the table. And so if you can imagine, especially when we were kids, when we were young kids, um, you know, we would all be at this table, and there was shouting and sharing of stories and the lazy Susans being spun and people are trying to grab things while they're being passed. And there just was like so much chaos in it. But at the same time, there was so much beauty in it. And I think this table, the table of the Lord, it's not our table, it's not my table, but it's the table of the Lord. And he invites us as part of his family to come to this table. And I love this picture because when you think about being part of a community or part of a family, there is always the crazy uncle who has conspiracy theories that you don't agree with. There's always the really loud aunt, right, that's yelling and, and, and making obscene jokes or whatever it is. But even through all of our differences and through all the places that we've come from, we still come to the same table and we still share the same bread and the same cup. And, and I think that is true whether you're in person here or you're online, we are all coming to this table this morning. And so when Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples, he took the bread and he did what he always does. He blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body 
broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup, the cup of the new covenant, and he said, this is my bl- blood shed for you. And every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do so in remembrance of my death. We share in that suffering. But ultimately, we know that it leads to resurrection. And so as a family today, can we come to the table of the Lord together through all of our shared experiences? We're all mothers today. We've all suffered today. And we've all been adopted. So as you come to the table, we have two stations set up here. And um, there, we're, we're using the real bread now, which is great, tastes great. And there's also these little cups that have wine in it. Uh, if you don't want the real bread or if you don't want wine, there's also the prepackaged cups that have a little wafer and some juice in it. Uh, and so as we come to the table of the Lord today, can we just be reminded that we are all coming with different experiences, but we are all coming as part of the family of God. So I wanted to make a quick note on those cards. If you want to give that to your mom today, you can. If you do not, don't feel like you have to. (laughs) I wanted to make that clear. Um, But, you know, as I'm thinking about this table illustration that I used, a lot of times around the table, there's some arguing and, um, you know, especially as kids, you know, (laughs) kids bickering back and forth. And um, and, and I, I think I wanted to leave you guys with this, is that love is all about forgiving. Again, and again, and again. Families survive only if this happens. And I'm not just talking about your own family. I want to make that clear. I'm talking about this family. I'm talking about the family of God and being part of that family. Families only survive if this happens. A parent is meant to be the compassion of God. The father and the mother of the prodigal son and the bitter brother who embraces the child, not because the child is worthy, but in spite of all the unworthiness, a parent must ever say in a word and attitude, return as far as you can, and I will come the rest of the way. And so I leave you with that this morning as we leave this place. You are a mother. You have this compassionate heart of God. We all have suffered together. And that's a part of what it means to be in a family. And we've all been adopted into this beautiful family of Christ. So go in his peace this morning and remember that you are a child of God. Amen. Amen.